Over the years, several famous casinos have burned to the ground, some due to architectural, building, and safety enforcement issues, and others due to insurance fraud. In the case of the El Rancho Casino, there was no fraud. It was only arson. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Thomas Hull, a lodging contractor with El Rancho Hotels in Fresno, California and Gallup, New Mexico, may have stopped to change a tire along Highway 91 just short of Fremont Street in Las Vegas and declared, boy, I wish I had a swimming pool to dive into, or that may have just been made up for good publicity. But something convinced him to buy 57 acres of sand in nowhere Nevada. Maybe it was just good salesmanship by local businessman James Cashman. Hull paid $150 an acre to Mrs. Jessie Hunt, whose husband had paid $10 an acre. She was thrilled. The resort opened on April 3, 1941. Spanish exterior, solid wood rustic interior, with 63 small cabins. Each had a little bit of grass out front, a porch, and a tiny kitchen. The resort was designed as a way station a break for families on their trip through Nevada, not as a casino. Located at 2500, the southwest corner of what became Las Vegas Boulevard, also known as the Strip, and San Francisco Avenue, which later became Sahara Avenue. The property had a giant pool, horseback riding, and a revolving door of owners, casino lessees and lessors, and lots of fronts. The hotel made money, but Hull couldn't handle things in a mobbed up town like Vegas, so he sold the property to new owners in June of 1943. Mo Dalitz and Meyer Lansky may have had points in the casino licensed to Hilton Brown. The property itself went to Joseph W. Drown for $950,000. Thirteen months later, Mr. Drown was convinced to sell his property to Wilbur Clark and Clayton Smith for $1.2 million. He profited and was safely out, he thought. The mob was in. In 1945, Clark partnered with California businessmen Joseph and Walter Gazzardi, and they took over operations as Clark ran the casino. The fix was definitely now in, and the Gazzardis couldn't make much profit without casino income, which was supposed to be 10%. But Clark wasn't reporting much profit. Still, the property grew, added a larger Old West theme, a giant windmill, which became the new resort's moniker, and in typical Las Vegas casino ownership theft, the Cazardis were only working with a mortgage to drown and had to sell back to him now at a loss. A mishmash of lawsuits and petitions followed, and so did a sweet deal for Sanford Adler to take over ownership in February of 1946. Money from the casino was still going east. All was well again in Las Vegas. We know this because, just like the casino deal Adler would get into a few years later, he suddenly lost his lease, and Jake Kettleman fronted a new group as a casino manager and principal stockholder. Adler was living. Jake Kettleman was an old-time gambler who employed Wilbur Clark at one point, just as Tony Carnero had. But exactly how did Clark get all that money to build the desert inn? Also in the El Rancho Casino Group were Tommy Boss, Guy McAfee, and Milton Farmer Page. They expanded the restaurants, the Roundup Room, and brought more pit bosses from Steubenville, Ohio. Those men often felt the floor quake during a hot dice roll, as Cadleman would stop his foot as the dice were about to settle. He also threw pennies under the roulette wheel and sprinkled salt on losing blackjack games. Helpful or not, the casino was very profitable. Jake's nephew, Belden, married the daughter of the president of Columbia Pictures, which helped fill the property with stars like Elizabeth Taylor, the Gabor sisters, and later actors like Natalie Wood, Paul Newman, and Joanne Woodward. Jake Kittleman died in June of 1950 after an auto accident. His 36-year-old nephew purchased his 495 shares in a sweetheart payment deal for $185,000 which included any outstanding debt. That left, as usual in Las Vegas, Jake's widow with uh, very little income. But even with a lawsuit by other shareholders, the deal went through. Although Belden arranged to buy out the other partners and began upgrading the property, things started looking a little strange. It was a very unmod thing to do, spending all that money upgrading. 
He was tough, and when John Mayer didn't pay off his markers, he was detained and beaten. His wife brought cash to have him released. Later, they both sued. Kettleman won. Another similar incident took place the following year. Same issues, same results. In 1954, Belden held 20% of the Last Frontier Hotel down the street from the El Rancho Vegas with Jake and William Kozloff and Murray Randolph. Belden said the murky administrative setup was devised to misappropriate a million dollars in hotel funds. The tax commission called it a voting trust to control the resort's affairs. Eventually, Cattleman sued, leading to punches thrown by another partner, Mo Friedman, who, like half of the casino owners in Las Vegas, was listed as a businessman from Beverly Hills. Many were friends, or can I say most. Overall, the Chicago outfit was less than thrilled with Cattleman drawing attention to hidden ownership. The resort underwent a $3 million renovation, dumping the Old West theme for French Provincial. The Roundup Room became the Opera House. Competition was fierce along the strip at the time, with Jackie Friedman taking the reins at the Sands. He liked to dress up in cowboy clothes and holler at the guests, Hey, y'all, keep playing, suckas! He also sent a giant floral arrangement for the Dunes' grand opening, including a white carnation-covered box shaped like a coffin. He was a hoot. Cattleman dealt with a paternity suit by granting the young lady $10,000 and later saying, well, I met her once, but that was it. He was also dealing with the crazy Marshall Caifano. The Opera House brought stars, including strippers like Lily St. Cyr. It also brought Candy Barr as a headliner at the El Rancho Vegas in 1959, where the FBI arrested her after her appeal on a marijuana conviction in Texas went south. The property closed for two days in 1959, when Aronoff filed a writ of attachment against El Rancho Vegas, retaliation for Cattleman trying to keep unsavory partners out of the fold. Although the writ was dismissed and the resort reopened, Aronoff and his partners weren't happy. Aronoff later wanted half a million dollars and a chance to get out of the partnership, so Belden made some arrangements. In 1960, Cattleman sued Aronoff for financial losses caused by the casino closure. However, Cattleman lost in court on June 15th when a judge ruled he needed to pay Aronoff the remaining $240,000 on their contract. In the 1950s, the Chicago outfit placed Marshall Caifano, a psychopathic killer who liked to use flame torches on his victims, in charge of keeping the skim flowing from Las Vegas. Caifano would grab showgirls from chorus lines and drag them to his room where he assaulted them. He screamed at servers, kicked dealers when they were losing, and insulted gaming control board members. His maniacal, abusive behavior was mirrored only by his loud, ugly suits, leaning to bright yellow and rust colors. Caifano often fought with Cattleman for his reluctance to allow outside partners and in his infuriating way of avoiding freebies. In June of 1960, Cattleman had Caifano physically removed from the property after a heated argument. On June 17, Caifano entered the backstage area of the showroom where Harry James and Betty Grable were entertaining. Once there, he started a fire that spread to the kitchen, and soon the entire property was a blazing inferno with flames seen from the downtown casinos. Pearl Bailey tried to drive off with her friends Phil Ford and his wife Mimi Hines, but crashed her car into a tree, unable to see through black, billowing clouds of smoke. Much of the damage was captured in photos by entertainer Red Skelton, including the collapse of the landmark 50-foot-tall windmill. The ruined hulk of the resort stood for months as insurance and fire investigators walked the scene taking notes. A hotel cook said a man had asked that night where the fire started in 58. That fire caused $300,000 in damage. The man was never identified, and the cause of the fire was never determined. Damage was estimated at over $5 million. Afterward, Chicago didn't do anything to stop Caifano, but Nevada finally did. The Gaming Control Board issued its black book detailing people excluded from all casinos in the state for their unsavory characters. Caifano was number one. Amazingly, the resort's cottages were undamaged, and while modest architectural drawings were produced, the El Rancho Vegas 
was never rebuilt. Instead, Cattlemen leased the cabins to the Thunderbird Resort across the street so they could send their overflow crowd. Finally, in 1968, Howard Hughes agreed to purchase the property for $7.5 million. In typical Hughes form, it took a lawsuit and two years to close the deal at a later agreed upon $8.5 million. He shut everything down, and by 1978, there were no remaining structures. Later, Circus Circus owner Bill Bennett purchased the property, but it sat for another decade. In 1976, the Thunderbird Hotel changed its name to the Silverbird. That property became the El Rancho Hotel in 1982 and closed in 1992. Thanks for watching Nevada Gaming History's look at the El Rancho Vegas. And for more stories about Sin City, read Vegas and the Mob, available at your local bookstore or Amazon.